I agree. Okay, thanks folks who've joined us so far. I see Carl, some familiar names, Johanna, June, Judy, Karen, all my friends, Lisa, that's great. Some unfamiliar names as well. Troy, good to see you, Troy. Okay. Okay, so it looks like um, a couple of people are still joining, but I'll go ahead and get started with introductions anyway. So again, thanks for joining us tonight. This is our first webinar since our summer break, which we usually take. And we're excited just to be back. And I think we have a, a great um, presentation for you tonight. So this is of course hosted by the Edmonton chapter of Dying with Dignity. And I'm a volunteer with the Edmonton chapter. You can reach out to us uh, at our email address on the screen there if you have any questions. For tonight, we are hosting this as a webinar, meaning your cameras and your microphones are turned off, but you can still engage with, with us if you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you do have a question, please submit it and we'll hopefully be able to get to it after the presentation. And if we can't get to it, we'll try to make sure we can answer it afterwards. If we have any challenges with the webinar tonight, technically, then just try to use the same Zoom link to log back in and we'll try to get that back up within 10 minutes. I will say that if you have a really specific question about medical assistance in dying, our speakers probably won't be able to address that. So I have included on the screen here information for the MAID care team here in Alberta. And if you have further questions after the webinar, I would encourage you maybe to reach out to our head office and they can also point you in the right direction. So of course, Dying with Dignity Canada, uh, our mission is to use advocacy, public education and personal support to ensure Canadians have access to quality end of life choice and care. So if you're not a member, I, I assume a lot of you got this because you already receive our emails, but I encourage you to uh, join us if you support this mission and want to learn more, sign up for emails and uh, we'll make sure you learn about for future webinars. Locally, we have the Edmonton and Calgary chapters, which are really active. Uh, of course, before COVID, we were a little more active, but we have been keeping up with information sessions like this. So if this interests you, if you wanna get involved, I encourage you to reach out to your local chapter. I think we have some folks from the Calgary chapter on the call tonight as well. I'll mention too that Dying with Dignity is hosting their first conference. This will be a series of webinars from November 2nd to January 27th. So if you go to the upcoming webinar page on our website, you'll be able to see all of the great speakers that we have lined up and sign up for those sessions. So I encourage you to do that. And that brings us to our guest speakers for the evening. Um, I'm really happy that both of you are here tonight through some other connections that we have. I was able to connect with SIG and we came up with this idea for tonight's session. So I'll start by introducing SIG. SIG has been a nurse since 1988 and is currently teaching nursing at Vancouver Community College. Sig's dad utilized MAID in July, 2018 and going through that experience with him inspired her to set up the not-for-profit Bridge For You. The project launched in April, 2021 and they currently have 20 volunteers across Canada. And then our second speaker or second guest tonight is Lauren Clark. She's the, a volunteer president and CEO of Bridge C14 and is also a professional social, social worker at the Ottawa Hospital. Lauren has been involved in MAID-related work since 2016 and is deeply passionate about providing a safe and supportive community for those journeying through MAID. So we're going to hear from them about both of their great organizations. So I will invite Lauren to share your screen if you like. 
Okay, that looks really good. So I'll turn my camera off and let you guys take it away. Thanks for doing this to me. So I really like this quote here. Um, and I really want to thank Dying with Dignity, especially the Edmonton chapter for inviting us tonight um, to speak with all of you about the work that we do. And I find this quote really speaks uh, in great volumes to what we do and why we exist. Um, so some of the most comforting words in the universe are me too. That moment when you find out that your struggle is also someone else's struggle, that you're not alone and that others have been down the same road. And certainly for those who journey through MAID, finding that community and connection is so important. So tonight um, we're gonna do, uh, you know, Brad gave a, a nice introduction. My apologies, my cat decided to knock everything over. Um, and we just wanna look at sort of the reasons for and the benefits of accessing peer-to-peer -peer support, um, focusing both on the work of Bridge C14 and Bridge for You, um, and then our partnership that we're in development uh, with Dying with Dignity Canada. So I'm Lauren Clark. I am the president and CEO of Bridge C14, and I've been with the organization since its launch um, on November 1st of 2017. So we're coming up on our four year anniversary. And uh, in, as a professional uh, social worker, uh, part of my role is working with our MAID program at the Ottawa Hospital. And um, I've been you know, involved very much since the very beginning um, and have witnessed the, the growth and expansion of all the programs. And I think it's really amazing what's happening in the MAID space. And I'll turn it over to Sig. And my name is Signe, Signe Novak, and I am the founder of Bridge For You. And I came across uh, Lauren about, mm, I was thinking about it on a walk today. It was probably just over a year right now where I found her online and I just emailed her and then she sent me her phone number and I just called her and we made a connection um, pretty pretty instantly actually I, I called her a couple times and kept kind of pushing the idea of me wanting to do some pre-made support set up a project and noticed that she had more of a focus on post-made support so I thought what a great partnership we might be able to make and um so yeah so here we are so certainly the the peer-based support model which both bridge c14 and bridge for you are built on um really it it shines a light on that grief and bereavement process that we know is part of the may journey and you know being able to find connection with others whether you are somebody who is requesting made for yourself or for you know a loved one who's journeying with someone through their maid um, up until their maid provision or afterwards in that grief journey, as well as for professionals and volunteers, um, really that connection with one another, that shared experience and lived experience is so important. And it's creating that safe and non-judgmental space um, that I think many seek. And we, we often hear stories of, you know, this is the first time I've ever shared this with anyone. I've kept this to myself. And so really it, it shines that light on why organizations such as ours need to exist um, because we provide that made specific support that often uh, individuals don't find that in other um, grief groups that they join or in counseling. Um, it's not the same as that lived experience and that peer-based support. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Sig. No, you covered that thoroughly. <laughs> So at Bridge C14, uh, we are a national nonprofit organization. So we were launched uh, by Jan Ditchfield, who uh, journeyed with her mom through her mom's maid provision. And I met Jan at a conference early in, in March of 2017, and we spoke together and I heard Jan's story and she talked about, you know, this gap that exists. Um, and we knew that there was a gap at that time in terms of access to support uh, for loved ones and, and those larger support networks, um, really to connect with others. And so she, you know, threw this idea out there. Um, and I joined on board and, and said, you know what, I'm, I'm all for this. So I joined its founding board of directors, um, and then took over as president and CEO of June of 2019. And 
really what we are is building this community um, and an and access point for people to be able to come in, find what they need in terms of support and sort of a centralized place where they can um, build those connections, whether that's on a one-to-one -one level or in our drop-in sessions or our grief support groups and in the partnerships that we have with other organizations in the MAID space and being able to provide that access to compassionate support um, and creating that culture where dignity, choice and grief are honored and valued. Um, and we truly hold firm with that because that is the mission statement of Bridge C14. And the vision has always been to allow individuals to come in to the maid space and feel that support around them. And we want to make sure that whether that's before, during or after they feel that support around them. So um, here we are. And, and again, coming up on our four year anniversary, which is just amazing when I think about that. So what do we do? Again, we provide that access to peer-to-peer -to -peer connections and community support through all stages. Um, certainly most of our focus uh, has always been on that post-maid and, and grieving a maid death. Um, but what we've recognized is that individuals who are going through this pre-maid also need um, a spot where they can join up with others who understand and appreciate where they're at uh, because they are also at that point in their journey. So um, with the support of Bridge for You and that, uh, and I'll let Sig talk about her program next, um, but we are now developing more programming and drop-in sessions and grief groups for um, individuals who are um, to have requested made uh, that for uh, family members or loved ones, and then also our, our brief support afterwards. So um, we're seeing the enhancement of supports because of feedback. Um, and again, bridging that gap um, between the medical side of made and the other side, which is all of those psychosocial aspects. Um, and we want to make sure that we hone in on that. And it's again, that safe place for others to, to build that connection um, and that sense of community. So how do we do this? Um, we do, we have peer to peer connections. So, uh, you know, there are times where we'll have um, someone reach out to us and say, can you set me up with um, some one to one support? I'm grieving a maid loss and I'm not sure what I'm doing. And I, I just want some help to navigate this grief journey so we can make those arrangements. Um, we have links to support uh, before, during and after um, through various resources, um, access to maybe it's private counseling or uh, death doula. Um, so we provide a, a place where individuals can come in wherever they're at in their journey and find that connection. Um, we have podcasts and blog posts, newsletters, um, our grief support groups and our drop-in sessions. Um, so we recently uh, brought the Made Grief Recovery Group under um, our wing and have now taken the programming that um, they created and developed and started and in, in, in partnership with Bridge C14 and moving it as a streamlined access point uh, now for individuals to come in, uh, either drop in or participate in one of our structured grief support groups. Um, we also have informational materials that we can hand out uh, our Facebook support groups. So we have both one for um, individuals with lived experience, and then we have another for professionals and volunteers uh, to build that community of practice. And then we go out and we do education and presentations um, and, and really what we want to do is just continue the conversation, um, talk about what MADE is and, and the need for that support, in particular, that peer-to-peer -peer support. Okay, so you can see why I wanted to partner with uh, Lauren here. You can see that she's quite a uh, person having put this together, literally, well, yes, with support, but she's really running this on her own. And so um, I was inspired by the work she'd done and really wanted to come on board with her and not only learn from her, but just build on both, actually build on both of our strengths. And, you know, now that we've been together for a year, I must say we are uh, working so amazingly well as a team and it's just it's been a gift just getting to know her. And so, you know, life is strange that way. I, I, I put this project together because when I went through it with my dad, there was literally no resources. And yeah, I was, um, 
going through it with him in a smaller community, Penticton, where, you know, it wasn't a major center. So, you know, resources were, were slim and as they are actually here in Vancouver, um, but really nobody was talking about any kind of support pre-made. Um, my sister and I were talking and thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great to just be able to call somebody up one-on-one -on -one and just ask some questions that you maybe don't feel comfortable asking the physician or the social worker. Maybe you just wanna really be vulnerable and share with, some, to share with somebody how maybe frightened you are or, you know, there's a number of questions that go through your head before your family member does this. So I called around, I decided after he died that, you know, within that six month period, I was like, I'm just going to call around different places in Canada that, prov that are supporters of MAID, that have resources for MAID, and I'm just going to collect some data and see if this does exist, this pre-MAID support. After I talked to Lauren, I pretty much knew if she said it didn't exist, it likely didn't. I called a few places here in BC, uh, Alberta, uh, more, more various physicians, anybody who was involved in MAID and basically it didn't exist. So, okay, so I started it up and now jumped to a year or more later and uh, we have volunteers from Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta and BC. We have about 20, however, only about 15 are doing actual one-to-one -one peer support. We're having our first orientation session on Monday, which I'm really excited about. And um, just so that we are all on the same page as we support uh, individuals, we've had quite a few requests via the website. Our website has um, lots of different, um, well, it's got stories on it, which people find really helpful. Um, but our website is a place where you could go to, to, to read about MAID and learn a little bit about MAID or very simply, or you can volunteer from there. You can fill out a volunteer application. Um, and, and so basically the website launched, we got all these volunteers started to just do, I just started to do one-on-one -on -one training with volunteers, just kind of ad hoc as support was coming in. And now we're going to officially have this training, which will be great. So yeah, um, we basically connect people before the maid death. So um, if you want to talk to somebody before your loved one is going through it, you can go to our website, go to the contact page and tell us a little bit about yourself. And then from there, we, we match you with a person that would be, um, you know, if you're, if you're going through it with your spouse, then I wouldn't match you with somebody that, that went through it with their, their daughter or their mother, for example. So yeah, we are having really, really great success so far, have had a lot of support requests and we're getting a lot of great feedback. So um, we, we debrief each call that, is, that happens, we do a debrief after. And um, as we're growing, our processes are changing. So going forward, the debrief piece is super important, but I think, it, it's been it's been me that's been debriefing with all the volunteers and now we're going to be more of a kind of a mentoring approach between volunteers so yeah lots is changing uh, but it's all exciting um and that's pretty much it we do we do some people don't want to contact um don't want the support through the phone they want to just email so we email back and forth with some individuals some just want to text i've texted with a few younger people that just want to keep it nice and safe um but then there's the majority of people a couple of which have done zoom they've asked for that and then i would say the majority on the phone so yeah Perfect. And, and I think this is the, the sisterhood that we have created here between Bridge C14 and Bridge for You. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I highly respect Sig. And from the instant that she called me, I said, okay, you've got my wheels turning. And, and I see this being such a strong connection and, and that full continuum of care in many ways. And, and I think that's most important is that we have, we have bridged 
completely now um, from one end of the spectrum to the other. And I think that's just, it's a really amazing thing. I, you know, I so appreciate what SIG has created and, and how watching it grow reminds me so much of the early days of Bridge C14 and, and we continue to grow. And I think it's just inspiring and empowering um, and just really encouraging that these conversations are happening and that individuals are seeking that support. Um, so we are meeting the needs and, and really at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. cool. Cool. Again, there's always volunteer opportunities um, at any point in time um, in terms of both providing that peer to peer one to one support. Um, and, you know, there are some volunteers that are sort of crossed between both of our organizations um, and we'll, some will support and say, you know what, I'm, I'm quite comfortable, um, you know, following someone or supporting someone after a made loss. And so um, I think those are those special volunteers that it takes to do that one-to-one -one support. Not everyone wants to do it or can do it, but we've got a really great group. And I think it's how do you build this and make it a more robust program? Um, so we're always open to having conversations around what a volunteer opportunity may look like. Um, and then for Bridge C14, we also have our group facilitators um, and we're always looking for volunteers. We'd like to have you know, groups ongoing, um, happening much more often than what we have now. Our drop-in sessions are currently twice a month. We'd like to see that increase, um, and as well as our structured grief groups. Um, the you know the need is there. We want to make sure that we're able to fulfill that. Um, and then we have you know opportunities to uh, contribute as a blog on a blog post, um, and those can be done anonymously as well, or as a podcast guest. Um, so we're always looking for for people to to share their story. Awesome. So maybe Sig, I'll, I'll let you kind of talk about our, our exciting new partnership that's in the works. Oh, yes, we're, we're, we've been working on this for a few months now. And I know Lauren has been wanting this for a very long time. But we're on the cusp of just forming a, you know, a, a partnership with Dying with Dignity Canada, which would just would really be such a beautiful thing because they are obviously the national organization and you know they can really put us on the map so to speak you know um, and help us increase in every area of like all the different um, arms that you saw on that slide that, that Lauren's involved in with Bridge C14 help just to provide that support for each of those areas so, yeah, um, we want to provide a streamline, like it says here, and better capture referrals between organizations. I want to be able to be talking back and forth with someone from Dying with Dignity. If I have somebody that perhaps, you know, they could support, or maybe I want to debrief with one of them, um, I'd like to see our resources as a shared space where, you know, if they have volunteers that they've trained, perhaps they want to come and work with Bridge C14, uh, Bridge uh, Bridge for You for uh, six months. You know, I just want to see it as more of a collaborative um, situation, and uh, really, really, uh, we're excited. We're meeting with them this Friday, so uh, stay tuned. Absolutely, and and as Sig mentioned, this is you know Bridge C14 has always had a connection with Dying with Dignity Canada, particularly in the Ottawa region. Um, when we did a sort of a, a trio with our Bereaved Families of Ontario Ottawa chapter as well, and to see this grow now and really to to be building as I said, that collaborative approach um, on all ends. Again, it's looking at the advocacy piece, the pre-made piece, the post-made, the, you know, I think it's so important that we work together. Um, why not? We're both, you know, all three organizations are doing incredible work um, and we can highlight what each organization does in so many ways. Um, so this is really exciting. So, uh, you know, hopefully we can get things up and running really soon. Um, so again, stay tuned for the details. So if you're looking to learn more, 
um, check us out. Uh, both organizations have websites, um, multiple links, and, and again, that connection between one another. Um, and you can always send us an email. Um, we welcome any questions, feedback, anything that uh, is on your mind or suggestions. Um, if you've come across a situation or you know, you're know you thinking, what if this existed? Let us know. Um, the only way that we can learn and, and build more um, in terms of what we're doing and what we're able to offer is through feedback um, from everyone. So we welcome that. Great, that's fantastic. Thanks both of you for putting that together. So I'm curious about in the conversations that you are having with people, especially around the pre-made experience, I'm wondering if there are kind of common themes that you're running across in terms of what people are looking for information on or what people are unsure about. And if we can use those conversations to help identify some gaps or failings in the system in terms of accessing made. Mm. Um, well, I guess I can start here, Lauren. Um, some of the themes would be, um, you know, how do, how do we involve kids? And do we involve kids? That would be one thing. Uh, general theme is just, I don't know what to expect. And, you know, um, can we just talk about what it was like for you, right? They have no idea what to expect. Because um, these are family members, they're not necessarily people that are getting the face to face with a social worker or, or with a physician, right? So they really have just general fears or general, you know, some have fears, some have worries, uh, some are just um, apprehensive. And once you have the conversation, they say, wow, okay, now I really have a handle on how I want to go forward and some of the questions I want to ask. So it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, you know, I talked to somebody the other day that just basically said, I've got three siblings, we all have different beliefs around this. How do I how do I go forward? Right. And, you know, in my family, we didn't have that situation. So it's also knowing where the resources are and where to point people, you know, and so yeah, I mean, it, it really varies what people are what people are, are are needing and and to add to that i think what a lot of people say and we always know that feeling prepared for what is what they can sort of anticipate or expect and and you're never going to be able to answer all the questions because obviously the situation is different parts of in different parts of the country between city to city you never really know and even in the same city on paper, they may look very much the same, but the situation can be very different. Um, so it's giving enough information so that people feel prepared um, and, and recognizing that it's not always the medical piece that people are worried about. It's more, how do we, how do we cope and and deal and have those conversations like how what do we tell others how much do we say um you know that duality in roles i'm a caregiver and i'm trying to still have that that side of things but i'm also feeling like i'm spinning out of control because i don't know you know i don't know how i'm going to process this um so i think it's that name and i always say name the grief um we need sometimes to know that this is grief and you're you have compounding losses and so it's how do you cope with that because what we see is when those uh, you know when individuals kind of keep all these things to themselves or don't have an outlet or a resource in terms of how to deal or process and and navigate this then they have significant grief complications after and really don't know what to do then with all of these emotions that have been building mm -hmm. I had a person once ask me if I could do it again, what would I do differently? If I could go through it again, and I'd never thought about it. But as I was talking to this person, it came to me. And I was like, wow, at the end of the call, I thought, wow, you know, I learned something from each call, something in me and sure you can be triggered your own grief can be triggered for sure. And you have to kind of keep tabs on that. Because the call is not about my grief. The call is about their grief. And so we're there as a listener, 80% and 20% talking. 
So, you know, it's, it's, I found great learning for myself just within the questions. It's been amazing, you know? So you never know, like Lauren said, you just don't, I, I go into it with an open mind and heart thinking anything could happen here. And just being open and knowing that I don't have to have any answers. I just have to be there, be there as that person that's been there in their same, well, in a similar situation is not in their shoes, but, but almost, you know? So, yeah. And I'm curious about the grieving process because it does seem like the ability to choose made changes the grief process a, a little bit. In some ways you might, you might plan your grieving a little bit better, let's say. And I know there's interesting research out of some jurisdictions that have had made for longer than we have around this. But I'm curious from your perspectives, how do you see this altering or changing the grieving process? I, I think what May does is it challenges a lot of the concepts around death and end of life. And I think that you know, while we can sort of anticipate some of the grief that we may experience or, um, you know, as you're journeying uh, through MAID, I think it's, there are challenges that come up that sometimes catch you, it's more of those catch you off guard. And it's often this stigma and that, and what we refer to as disenfranchised grief, you know, and that idea around, you know, what may be you know, appropriate in your social context is not in mine. And what do I do with that? Right. And this is, it's often challenges for someone's morals or values or ethics. And so when we have that internal struggle and we're trying to grieve and you're trying to also, again, carry on your day-to-day -day life and, and try you're, you've got so many hats um, that I think the grief journey unless it's named and someone is able to process that and reflect on it. Um, and sometimes it's just bouncing that off of someone else and getting reassurance that this is, this is normal, validating that um, validation is key. Um, and that's what I think that lived experience allows someone to feel that yes, they, that may not have been the exact same journey for that volunteer and myself as a, as a, you know, a client or a participant, but what I'm getting is that I'm not alone, right? And, and that's going to help the grief, but it, it can be complicated by so many different factors. Um, it's, it's remarkable. I've always referred to it as it's a, the onion. You peel back the layers and there's just more and more um, that will ultimately impact someone's grief. And it's also for the individual who is requesting MAID um, and their grief. Um, and, and it's helping to sort of navigate those murky waters um, pre, then jury, and then post, um, and recognizing what complications can come post if we haven't, you know, allowed ourselves to grieve. Mm -hmm. I this know the made process for myself personally was a beautiful thing because I mean, but I was different than my siblings. Like I come from a nursing background. I've, I've experienced death. I've been at the bedside of many people that have died. And so I was not scared of, in any way. I was just thankful for the opportunity to be with him and to be able to talk to him before and go share what I what I was struggling with around it you know and that's such a gift to be able to have that opportunity so I get I, I guess it can go either way because then you know one of my siblings had a terrible time because he'd never seen anything related to death and then when he saw my dad's body he just has this terrible r reminder of what that looked like. So you see, it, it's, it, it can become complicated very easily, but I think being able to talk to somebody before it really helps in that transition. Yeah, that's really interesting because I wonder what supports exist beyond your organizations for folks going through this process. And 
Um, I mean, we have a nurse and a social worker on the call. So I'm wondering, are there traditional supports that people can turn to within wherever it is that they are, or is there kind of a gap in that in that service? Well, it's you know, I think as a in my role as a social worker, um, you know, at the hospital with our MAID program, we support those who are accessing MAID in hospital. So it leaves a significant amount of people who are without that sort of concrete support um, from, a, from a professional from the MAID program. There are, you know, that's why Bridge C14 came to fruition was because there really wasn't that link. Um, and I remember, you know, certainly in 2016, um, saying to families and, and loved ones and saying, there really is nothing MAID specific out there. And so when Jan came up with this idea, it was like when Sig talked about this pre-made support, it was like the aha moment that this is what we need and this is why we exist. And I think it's a matter of, you know, some people say, well, how do we find out about you? And it's for us, a lot of it is networking um, and really building connections with made programs um, and offering, you know, our information out. And whether that's in a, an informational flyer or it's a presentation, um, so that people know that we exist and that these services are available in smaller community, in some communities, um, and sometimes in smaller communities, they have their own separate sort of made uh, or grief groups. And it's um, so a, a majority, I think, are probably set up through a hospice um, type setting. And so what we want to do is sort of bring those ones out of the shadows and say, we can highlight the work that you're doing. Um, and that's certainly what Bridge C14's focus is, is that, again, that access to information because if people don't know they exist and you know one of some of the things that we see now is well certainly covid not everybody is able to be there um i re remember being at provisions where there were 20 or 30 family members around the bedside covid comes in and everybody has to stand six feet apart you can't hug you can't kiss you know the the team is as somebody described it look like aliens um they're coming in so these are very different times and so you have to think how are our individuals then getting access to support if they're not there directly um integrated into this made program um and at the made provision so it's you know making sure that it's everybody else and, and i was you know it's that ripple effect um that i would talk about it's not just the individual it's not just the family or, or loved ones around it's also then the community and society and the healthcare team that's all impacted. Um, and it's making sure people have that safe place and knowing that services like ours, and, you know, organizations like ours are there to, to fill that need. I think that's great because I, I imagine that generally, unless you're in the immediate family or you're the primary caregiver, you wouldn't feel comfortable accessing supports within a hospital like the social worker or something like this to talk about your grief process because you might tell yourself well I'm not I'm not the immediate family member I'm not the primary caregiver so it's great that there's th this resource that people can reach out to and um and, and get that support so I, yeah I think this is fantastic we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A so I'll, I'll address a few of these uh, is one question from Carrie is that given that the MAID process is slightly different, different province to province, how important is it that you match people asking for support with peers in the same province? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we try to do that. And we're going to be doing that more as we bring on more volunteers from the various provinces. The goal, the vision is to have a national organization. So, you know, we have volunteers from every province and then eventually those, those groups of volunteers break off and run their, their, their um, project almost, you know, individually. And then the umbrella would be the bridge umbrella. That's how I see it. And it would be Lauren and myself kind of managing each of the groups in the different provinces. So a really good question. Um, we are trying very hard with time zones, it's tricky. And with the MAID coordination um, specifics provincially, it's tricky. So 
Ultimately, if we don't have a volunteer that we can match, then eventually I could have somebody from Ontario get back to that person if they weren't, um, if they weren't available for the initial support. It, it, would it be too late for someone who is interested after watching this webinar to attend your upcoming orientation? As a volunteer? Yeah. Well, if they have lived experience and they, uh, and then I would actually, I would talk to them. We usually have two people vet volunteers. So another person from the group would talk to them and then it gives the volunteer an opportunity to ask that person, hey, what's it like, you know, um, being involved. Um, but yeah, I don't see why not. That's great. Yeah, I just want to make sure that um, people remember that if you are interested to reach out and that orientations are happening and, and that they should uh, reach out and, and go through that vetting process. Yeah, and that's the same. We have a, an upcoming facilitator training for our drop in sessions and our structured grief groups. Um, and so we're going to be hosting one later, probably in November. Um, so anyone who's interested in becoming a facilitator, um, you know, for our structured grief groups, we'll be um, sort of doing a mentorship program. So you'll be connected with somebody else who's facilitating. Um, so you get a sense of what the group is like um, and how it runs. And, and same with our drop-in sessions as well. And again, it's the same process where somebody would apply um, to be a volunteer. And then I have a conversation with them one-on-one -on -one just to, to make sure it fits with, you know, our mission and values and, and just see what their experience is like. Um, because we do have a number of people who say I have lived experience and then we have others who are like me where I don't have that intimate made um, death within my own personal life but as a professional I have supported um, a significant number of uh, individuals and their families through this and so you know it's important that we have a balance as well um, and we won't you know, not include a professional who is interested who you know has experience in the made space um but we want to make sure that they appreciate um sort of all the again those complexities that come along with with made itself and, and are aware of those things and so getting a sense of what our our sessions are like is also really important now i do want to comment about the volunteers one thing that we we had talked about um making as a criteria is that you're one year or more post um, made having gone through it okay now I'm kind of changing my thoughts around it um, given I've had a lot of conversations with different volunteers now and we took on a volunteer where she went through it four months prior but she'd done a lot of grieving before it depends how long if someone's got a chronic illness you could be grieving for for a very long period prior to them dying and the death is almost like a relief Okay, so it really does depend on the person. So yes, we say we want you at least a year to have had time to yourself to not to just focus on your loss and get through that. But we make exceptions. Okay, so in general, it's a year. But, um, you know, I don't want to deter people from from asking to volunteer. I think we've turned one person away and said, you know what, give yourself some space and time and come back to us. And they said, oh, yeah, I'm going to come back. And so it was great. We had a, a lovely conversation um, and it made them really look at their grief. So, you know, yeah. Perfect. We have another question here. Do you provide support to people who get turned down with their made application? Mm -hmm. This is sort of when I've always, you know, thought about made and there, there is, you know, it's kind of does get siloed in some ways. And now, particularly with Bill C7 coming out um, and you have your sort of dual track, um, you know, track one is that reasonably foreseeable track two, uh, not reasonably foreseeable. So we see that there are, you know, are specifics within each group. Um, and so one of the areas that 
we have yet to create a group for, but I foresee something needing to be developed is a group for those in, found ineligible. Um, in particular, we've had a, recently a, a number of inquiries around that mental illness uh, as their sole diagnosis and really trying, you know, desperately to access made and not being allowed at this point in time. Um, and so, you know, in some cases we'll direct back to Dying with Dignity Canada, because I think there's a strong advocacy piece there. Um, and just staying, you know, up to date with what's happening uh, around the bill and, and what happens with this. Um, but I think there is a need. And, and certainly, this is how why programs get created is, is people reach out. And if there's one individual, it means there's another and it means there's another. Um, so it's just, in some ways, it's, how do you find those individuals who are found ineligible? How do they find you? Um, because in some ways, then they're, you know, they might not like where MAID is and, and may not think that our organization is going to support them if they're not found eligible, or they may not be provided our resource. Um, and so that's where word of mouth and that, uh, you know, the exposure to what, what we're doing uh, and what we can offer and what we can still develop. It's never to say no to that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this question might be uh, a tricky one to answer, but Judy's wondering, what do you say to people to prepare them for the MAID process? Uh, well, <laughs> from the Bridge C14 side, um, what we are looking at doing is sort of uh, looking at what's available right now in terms of, you know, some people have asked, can I have a checklist of what to expect? Um, you know, some want very much the specific information about the provision. And, and that might be, you know, there might be one document that is very much, you can anticipate such and such and such. And I think sometimes even for those who don't feel they want that information, and, and often it's, what does the day of look like? You know, what does, what can I expect is going to happen? Um, you know, I want to be prepared when, you know, if it's at home that when the nurse arrives and when the physician or nurse practitioner comes, what does that look like? What, how do they carry the medications? Those sort of things. So it's, again, sometimes it's very minute little details. So it depends on what the individual is looking for. Are they looking for that very specific um, information or are they more looking for that space to share um, the emotional side um, that comes with MAID? Um, and that's a very different conversation sometimes. But I think a lot of it comes down to around the anxieties around what is that day? You know, what is it all going to mean? What is it all going to feel like? And again, while you can try to prepare as much as possible. Um, inevitably, there are things that are going to pop up. And but I think it's also reminding people that it's things are going to come up. Um, and the famous line of the only thing that's predictable is unpredictable, right? And so we it's that preparation. Um, but reminding people that these things can come up, you know, maybe the, uh, you know, I had one who recently said, you know, the, the first made kit didn't work. So then the doctor had to, you know, fill the syringes. We weren't ready for that. You know, the physician started fumbling and was nervous. And so you see these mm -hmm. things. And so the whole experience changed, um, mm -hmm. you know, in those situations are, are rare in many ways, but it's, it's again, preparing for um, sometimes the things we're not prepared for. Mm -hmm. That's the long and the short of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think on a smaller scale, volunteers with Dying with Dignity have had these micro conversations when we've done the volunteer witnessing. And when we go in and we, we walk through the record of request form with an individual, a lot of these questions come up, a lot of their fears kind of come to the surface. And in so many cases, I think they just want to share a bit of their story and why they've made the decision and yeah I think even that that small conversation is it has been helpful so it's nice to see that there's the space for a more thorough conversation around that and I'll, I'll just mention that Karen uh, says this has been really informative kudos to you Lauren and Sig for seeing the need and then having the initiative to fill the void and I'll mention too that June it's suggest that DWDC 
could be requested to provide support for those not accepted for MAID and that Kelsey Goforth at the office in Toronto is really knowledgeable about those pieces. Thank you. I, I do want to explore a little bit. Um, we've, we've spoken a number of times here in Edmonton to our local College of Social Workers, and, and they've been very welcoming and very interested in the MAID process. Can you elaborate a little bit more about the role of a social worker in these institutions and what that looks like more formally? Yep. Um, so at the Ottawa Hospital, and again, every you know, institution is going to have their own MAID program and how they work with the team. Um, for us at the Ottawa Hospital, what we offer is that support when psychosocial issues are identified. So we at the very beginning, we were about 100% referral to any made uh, case. We were, you know, asked to be there to help. Um, so we would do, we complete a pre-made assessment. Um, so I created that uh, from the very beginning saying we need something to identify some of the psychosocial issues. And then being able to identify then helps us to examine how do we kind of work through and address those issues, um, the expected and unexpected issues. And so the social worker now um, we you know it's it's generally if, if an issue has been flagged through the process um, maybe that's by the the coordinators themselves or through the physician or nurse practitioner assessments um, so we go and we sit and we meet with the patient um, often with their supports around them or one or two supports and we just have a conversation and again it's more looking at you know some of those who's going to be there what are you you know what would you want the day of to look like those patient specific wishes and then we take into account you know the the family the what are those dynamics like what does that support network look like um you know are there going to be challenging dynamics and so we're really assessing um you know are there those who are in support of and those who aren't in support of this um have you you know made sure that your funeral arrangements have been made and you have a will and everybody knows where the will is those some of those advanced care planning aspects in so many ways and then we're there to answer questions um so you know our role can be all-encompassing and sometimes people need us a, a lot um as they're sort of working through this um and then others it's more the day of that they're they're concerned about and so we are there um in the room if if the patient wants us to be there and then we do a couple follow-up phone calls but it's not enough um and i've always said you know if there was more we could do um but again there isn't funding for made um this isn't a you know a in many institutions, it's not, there's no extra funding. It comes out of the budget um, that was there. And we all know most insti health institutions are, are running deficits. And so it's, how do you shine a light then on, on what we can do as social workers? And so, you know, there's various roles, um, you know, in the hospital in terms of being able to provide that support. But in the community, um, we go out and we educate those who are working in, you know, counseling agencies, um, community health centers. Uh, we go out and, and just talk to others who are doing this work um, on the ground and are going to be fielding some of those phone calls. Um, and it's just how do you prepare uh, professionals to be able to again, navigate these waters if they don't have that direct bedside experience. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for the social workers here who were really instrumental in supporting the volunteer witnessing activities, especially in institutions that had decided they weren't interested in the provision of MAID. It was really the social workers who were able to connect us with these patients and still make sure that they were accessing these services. So um, yeah, kudos to, to your program out, out in Ontario. Thank you. Um, Carrie has a great question, which is, she comments that you're both offering really vital services and besides making sure people know about your existence and encouraging volunteers with lived experience to volunteers peers, is there anything else that Dying with Dignity Canada He's frozen. Mm -hmm. I can think, I, I, I think I can answer the question. We really appreciate spreading the word 
amongst the chapters across Canada. I think that would be amazing. Is there anything else, Lauren, from that question? Could you read it? Can you pull up the chat? Sorry, was I frozen on my back? <laughs> you you were frozen, but you looked okay. You weren't making a funny face. You were good. <laughs> it sounds like um, you found the question though. Um, yeah, and I think, again, it's just, those referrals back and forth um, between the organizations is is really important and just knowing staying up to date with what each organization is doing and again it's word of mouth um, so you know if let's say you're uh, an independent witness um, and you're going out and you're meeting with patients and or clients or and their families or their supports or perhaps there's a lack of supports and you're advocating on their behalf also let them know about us. Um, we do have information flyers that you can, uh, you know, hand out or send electronically. Um, and it's just making sure that they, that individuals know that services do exist. Um, I think on the national level, it's just, again, highlighting what we're doing. Um, and this, this collaborative approach, um, very much a, a collective idea in the main space to provide compassionate support, however that support is delivered. Um, and in the way that each organization does that is, is there's, you know, we each do our own thing, but there's also a lot of overlap between us. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate, you know, the support, you know, even being here tonight, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to have these conversations and have the opportunities to, to talk about what we do as, as small grassroots organizations um, that are, you know, still in their infancy in so many ways. Um, but here we are, where, you know, and this conversation alone is just, it speaks volumes to, to the support um, that we're feeling from Dying with Dignity Canada. So. Thank well, you. in 20 years, Lauren, will be a household. That, that I want to be talked about at the kitchen table, you know, all those people over at, you know, Bridge for You and look what they're doing at Bridge C14. That's what we want, right? And, and I think it's, we just want to make sure that people know as, as, you know, it's the hardest thing for me to hear personally is when people say, I wish I had known you existed sooner. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's, how, what can I do as the president and CEO of this organization so that nobody ever has to feel that they went any period of time without a support around them? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's how do we do that? I would stand on top of buildings if I if they let me, um, but they don't. And so it's, you know, it's it's conversations like this and just spreading the word. Yeah. Slow and steady. I would love to see like an information package that's provided to people going through this process in whatever institution or wherever it is they're choosing to do this. I think, you know, accessing information and, and knowing about these organizations is so vital. And I know Sig and I have talked about maybe some disparity in being able to access information about MADE across Canada. Uh, I think you know, different websites from different institutions are easier or harder to navigate or depending on what institution you find yourself in, yep. you know, that institution might be more willing or less willing to provide you with the right information. And so I think that is probably one of the biggest barriers we need to overcome. I'm wondering if in your work, you've identified other barriers that you would address or, or think that we need to try and dismantle and making sure that people are comfortable talking about dying and comfortable talking about MAID and, and don't feel stigmatized in accessing MAID. The million dollar question there. Um, Access. I, it's really, I think it's, I, I just, uh, for me, what COVID has changed is the, again, who can be there? And so it's, it's how do you find access points for those who aren't directly involved with any, you know, with an institution and, and what do you do from there? Um, you know, how do people, you know, that's a, that's a gap is, is, you know, sometimes those forgotten supports and, or, you know, if you're, someone who's working in a healthcare setting and you know the staff are are really you know they're apprehensive around this this might be you know it, I received an email today about it's a long-term care home and the staff have never had a made provision there so there are you know it's who trains and who does 
what. Um, the other piece is, is where can we find funding to make programs exist, right? Um, how do you, and that's, you know, government funding, and, and we know that that's not always easy to access, but it's the recognition of what NAIT is, um, and really putting a value to it in some ways, and, and not that it needs to be monetary, but certainly, I think there's a lot of individuals who do this work um, without any compensation. And the challenge will be is, how long can we sustain that? Um, you know, it's great that we now have, you know, there's more education around this. We are seeing courses being developed um, for healthcare pro professionals uh, from any discipline. You're starting to see it integrated into the curriculum. But again, if there's no funding for this, there's, you know, it, it takes a special person to want to be involved in MAID, um, to want to talk about it. So, uh, you know, I think it's just how do you make it less taboo. Um, and I, I don't know, I think it's just putting it out there um, and not being afraid to talk about it. But we know that at the end of the day, not everybody uh, is a supporter. And so, you know, there's often that cautiousness around it. Um, you know, I work with someone whose spouse doesn't know that they're a part of our MAID program, um, because even in that household, it would be a division. And so they have chosen to have this, this cloak of silence in so many ways. And so it's, how do you support, um, you know, for, for those who, and, and those who do this in isolation and don't have a team around them, um, you know, who are providing support in some way um, to someone in whatever capacity, and they don't have a team to sort of back them up. So there's it's a lot of a lot of stuff <laughs> if I could change the world you know <laughs> yeah Sig did you want to comment on barriers or I just I just think how do we access people that aren't as as um educated or have as much money or aren't as white you know how do we access those people because I think stats are showing that those are the people that are being accessed right now those are the people that are accessing these resources our resources so you know how do we reach those communities of people yeah, that's a great point. I, I see we are at 7.30, so maybe we'll just go ahead and wrap up. Um, there are just a couple comments. Um, someone says that the virtual hospice website might be a great place to highlight the work of both of your organizations. And mm -hmm. someone else says, thank you for this session. It's a comfort to learn that the support is available to answer the scary questions, which You're is, welcome. I think, a fantastic summary of what of what we learned tonight. So I want to thank both of you again for sharing your time and, and knowledge with us. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who attended tonight and submitted great questions. Always um, appreciate everyone who attends our sessions. We will be hosting another session probably in November or December, another webinar. So if you, again, if you don't already receive emails from Dying with Dignity Canada, please do sign up and we'll make sure that you get information about that. I meant to ask, are either of your organizations able to accept donations? Both. They both are. Okay, yeah. great. So yeah. I'll just put a plug that if you appreciate the work of these two organizations um, or of Dying with Dignity Canada, do consider making a donation. I, as Lauren said, I think that, that goes a long way. So. Thank you. I'll go ahead. Yeah, I'll go. I will um, post the recording as soon as I can on the Dying with Dignity National Office webpage. So um, feel free to share that when that's out. But thank you again, everyone. I'll go ahead and end the session now. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Okay. Take Thanks care. Thanks everyone who came. Bye bye. Goodbye.